So again, everybody, uh, welcome to uh, Hope East Queens. This is our last service before we actually enter into the new year. So this is our last year, uh, service before we enter into the year uh, 2020. Um, and so I know some of you are making New Year's resolutions, and that's cool. I'm making a New Year's resolution too, which is that uh, I give you my word that in the year 2020, at some point, I'm going to get a haircut, right? But I've actually been really lazy over the last few months. But anyway, so, so today I actually want to do a sermon on entering into 2020 uh, in faith. So how can we enter into this year, into the year uh, 2020, uh, with faith? And so before we do that, I actually want to um, just open up, up with a, a word of prayer. Um, Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to thank you for this opportunity for us to gather together in the final uh, service before we enter into 2020. Um, and so I, I pray that as we learn about faith, uh, that you'll speak through us and allow it to be something that's applicable in our lives that we could take with us into the new year. Uh, I, I thank you again for this time. I pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Uh, so I want to share with you guys a story uh, first and, uh, before I actually uh, get into the topic of faith. So uh, many, many years ago, uh, there was a guy that I, that I met, and uh, he gave me a call, and we started connecting as he, we talked on the phone, and he said, hey, David, you know, uh, I, I just want you to know that um, I don't have a lot of friends in my life, so I really want us to be close friends, right? Um, and I was such, so touched by, by the gesture, and he was like, hey, Dave, you know, I, like, I, I, you're, you seem like somebody that I want to hang out with. You seem like somebody that I want to get to know. And, you know, me being somebody who likes to be liked, I'm like, really? Oh, man. <laughs> just warms my heart, right? I was so happy, you know? And so I finally end up meeting up with this guy. We end up hanging out. And, uh, and he proposes to me like this business venture, right? And, you know, at the time I was, I was kind of interested in it. So I was like, yeah, you know, like we were talking a little bit about it. And uh, over time, some time passed and we were connecting and, you know, uh, he kept telling me like, hey, Dave, you know, I'm so glad like, you know, we're, I'm, I'm getting a new friend like you, man. Like this, this has been amazing for me. You know, he kept like kind of hyping me up and hyping all that up, right? Uh, and then one day um, it turned out that the business venture didn't go through uh, and I never heard from this guy again, right? Now, uh, I was offended by this because had he just come to me from the beginning, like had he just come to me from the start and said, hey, Dave, I have a business venture, like, you know, that, that's the reason why I want to meet with you, like, you know, that, that would have been totally fine, right? I would have been totally, like, open to that and receptive to that, right? But uh, I felt like he played this whole song and dance, and then little did I know that he was actually talking to my other friends and other people that I knew and doing the same thing, right? So I felt kind of duped. I felt so used. I was like, oh, man, like, you didn't actually really want to be friends with me. Like, you were just using me. You know, you were, just, you were just kind of bringing me in so that you can get something from me. And the funny thing is that sometimes we do that with God. Like, sometimes we, 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 we treat God as if he's this insurance policy, right, where it's like, God, I just want something from you, God. And so the reason why I'm going to come to church the reason why I'm going to pray, the reason why I'm going to read the word is not really truly because I love you and I love spending time with you and being in relationship with you. It's because I, I want to get something from you, God, right? Um, so I'll give you guys a story. The, the, uh, the, the author, uh, Peter Rounds, writes in the Orthodox Heretic book, he, he writes a short story about, um, a fictional short story about like what if like in the end, what if in the end, and this is not going to happen, by the way, so don't freak out, but what if in the end, like we find out Satan wins, right? It's not going to happen, by the way, so don't, don't freak out, but like what if in that hypothetical scenario, like we find out that Satan wins in the end, right? So now we're all like coming before Satan in some type of tribunal, and Satan looks at us, and he says, here's the thing, like you have to denounce Jesus, and then you get to enter into the kingdom of heaven, Right? And then he leaves the story by saying, what would you do in that scenario? And, and it makes us think, right? It makes us think, like, why is it that we're in this? Is it, is it that we're in this because of what uh, Jesus can do for us in terms of the, the, the insurance policy to make sure that we feel safe, that, yes, I have my one-way ticket into heaven? Or is it because we actually love Jesus, because we actually enjoy spending time with him? And so entering in 2020 in faith, I'll tell you guys what Christian faith is not. Christian faith is not an insurance policy. It's more than just simply an insurance policy. It's more than just simply like, Jesus, what can you do for me? It's, it's, it's so much deeper than that, right? But then what is Christian faith? And so that's what we're going to explore today. So we know that it's not an insurance policy, that it's more than just simply an insurance policy. But what is Christian faith? Well, 
Bible says in Hebrews 11:1, 1, it says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So there's something that we hope for, and that's not necessarily something that we see. And you might say, well, that sounds a little bit ridiculous, right? Like, are you telling me that I have to live my life as a Christian, like, just based on no evidence about this? Like, no evidence about God, no evidence about Jesus. Um, and that's not actually what I'm telling you, and that's not actually what this is telling you. Uh, and I can prove that, but uh, give me a second. So, basically, uh, this is not necessarily about the evidence. Because I want you to know as a pastor, as a Christian, as a believer, right? Like, I'm not a Christian because there's no evidence of Jesus, Right? I'm not no, a Christian because there's no evidence of God. Right? Uh, I am a Christian because I believe that I have good reason to believe in these things. Right? And I don't, I don't have too much time today, so um, I wish I could do like a full all-out apologetics class or whatever. I'll probably roll some of that out later in the year. But um, I believe that I have good reason to believe in these things. Right? And, and so like, let's say, for example, I came up to you and I said that I'm God or I'm the Son of God. You have good reason to believe that's not true. Right? In fact, all you have to do is ask my wife, ask my kids, right? And they'll tell you, like, no, that guy's far from as perfect as possible, right? Like, all you got to do is tell the, ask the people that are closest to me. In fact, there's people in this room here that have known me for many, many, many years. And if I was to tell you that I'm God or come up here and tell you that I'm the son of God, right? Like, those people would automatically be able to tell you, like, no, that's not true. And I can verify that, right? Because that guy's a maniac, right? So... So you have good reason to believe that that's actually not true, right? But, but Jesus, on the other hand, like when he walked this earth, right, the people that were the closest to him, all the people that were closest to him, right, his, his family members, his parents, right, uh, his, his best friends, his 12 best friends that stood with him for three years every single day of his life, they all claimed this guy was the son of God. Right? In fact, even his brother, who actually was not convinced James during Jesus' lifetime, later on, right, after the resurrection, became incredibly convinced that he was the Son of God. Right? So we have good reason to believe these things. Right? And there's, there's other things which I can't talk about today in depth because, again, we, have, we just have, don't have that much time. But we have good reason and evidence. But this is even beyond evidence, actually. Because you can actually even have evidence. You can actually even be convinced with the evidence and say, hey, I believe it. I cognitively know it in my mind that there was this Jesus, and he died, and he resurrected. But this is different than that. That's, this, is, this is something that we hope for, meaning this is something that, that we, we look at Jesus' death and resurrection, and it actually will impact our lives. It actually will make a difference in our, difference in our life, right? Think about that. Think, think about it. Like, you can actually cognitively believe something like that, but not actually have it impact our life, right? But I believe, like, Jesus resurrected, but it's also like Lazarus resurrected. Lazarus resurrecting doesn't impact my life, right? <laughs> but Jesus resurrecting actually impacts my life. So I can actually believe one thing and the other thing, but it's like, it, how does that actually impact us on a daily basis? Like, how do we actually go out of here and, and live and see the world differently, because of this, because this, this news, this thing that has happened where Jesus coming and dying for our sins, right, makes all the difference in our world, in the way that we perceive everything, right? So you might say, again, you might say, well, that, that's hard. That's difficult. Because how is it that I'm supposed to walk out these doors and, and perceive everything differently, right, when, when the evidence isn't in my face all the time, right? How am I supposed to possibly do that? And I want you guys to know, by the way, that there's not a single person in this room that doesn't live by faith. There's not a single person sitting here in this room that doesn't live by faith. Everybody in this room lives by faith one way or another. So I'll give you guys multiple examples of this, right? Whether you're a Christian or non-Christian, you live by faith, and I'll give you guys multiple examples. Okay, uh, the first example is, is, is love, right? So uh, do you believe in love? Now, when we think about love, right, uh, you, you know, love is such a, as I mentioned last week, it's such a complicated thing, right? Because sometimes we can't even describe what love is. You know, I mentioned this last week. It's like, what is exactly love? Is it, is it a sexual desire for somebody? Is it, a, is it attraction for somebody? Is it, is it attachment for somebody? Is it a committed attachment for somebody? Is it a warm attachment for somebody? Is it a kind act 
It's probably all of, all of the above encompassed in somewhere, right? Like there's this concept of love that's good. It's just good somewhere in there. It's just, and you know it when you see it. You're like, well, that's good. That's love, right? And that's the way that we live our lives. We live our lives as if love is like this real thing and it's just good. And yet we can't seem to prove it. <laughs> we can't seem to see it. And yet we live our lives as if it's good. We live our lives as if love is actually a real thing and it impacts our life. And you need faith to do that. You need faith to really believe in love, right? So I'll give you guys another example, and this might be a better example for some of you, right? Do you believe that certain things are just right and certain things are just wrong? Do do you believe in morality, that there's actual morality, that certain things are just right and you just know it, it's right? And if I was to ask you, like, how do you know that? Like, give me the evidence, prove to me that, right? Give me the, the objective evidence that these things are right and these things are wrong. I bet some of you would just come up to me and say, well, sh- I just know, you just know, right? You don't need evidence, you just, you just know. You know what that is? That's faith. You're living in faith. You just gave me an example of living in faith. And that's what Christian life is. Christian life is just it's living in faith, you know, it's, it's something that's inside of you that, that reaches your heart and, and it impacts you and it actually impacts the way that you perceive everything. And so the third thing, what is Christian faith? It, it moves your heart and then your actions. It has to move your heart and then it has to move your actions. So um, there's a, a philosopher, a famous philosopher named Šižek, who's a Slovenian philosopher. And I, I don't really know exactly what his religious stance is, but uh, one day he, uh, uh, a young man came up to him uh, who was an atheist, and he asked uh, Shijek the question. He said, Shijek, uh, can you prove to me the existence of God? He said, I want you to give me all the evidence that you know about the existence of God, right? Uh, and then, su- surprising to the young man, like Shijek actually counters with, with a question of his own. And he says, okay, if I do this, if I give you all the evidence, if I prove to you the existence of God, if I give you all the evidence, right, will your entire life change? Will the way that you perceive everything change? Will this impact you in your life more than anything else in this world? And the young man said, no. And then Shijek responded, then it doesn't really matter. Then it doesn't really matter, right? Because you can cognitively know it, you can be convinced of it, but unless it actually reaches your heart and impacts you and then impacts your actions. And that's why in the book of James it says, faith without deeds is dead. And that's not meant to be something that's legalistic. That's meant to be that when you actually believe in the claims of Jesus, the death and resurrection and his glorious sacrifice he poured out to us, it reaches our hearts and then in turn it moves our action. So there's a a, um, popular character in the Old Testament that many of you might be uh, familiar with named Abraham, right? And one of the funny things about Abraham, at least it's kind of funny to me, is that um, for some reason in the New Testament, it's constantly reiterated. Like this guy, Abraham, he wasn't great because he was such a great guy. He was great because of his faith, right? So it's constantly reiterated, his faith, 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 right? If you even read Romans, it's about faith, 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 faith. And, but when it talks about faith, it, it doesn't talk about faith in a standalone way. It doesn't just simply say, well, he just had faith, and that was it. Like, what does it actually say about the actions of Abraham? It says, by faith, Abraham... When called to go to a place he would later receive as inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were their heirs with him of the same promise. So what is the passage saying? It's not just saying that Abraham was a man of faith, because I I think that's something that we've probably known if you grew up in Sunday school, but it's like, No, Abraham is a man of faith who then takes action with his faith. So action actually comes along with his faith. It's not just simply that he receives his faith, but it's like that actually leads him out, and he actually ends up having to leave everything that he's familiar with behind and go to a completely different place, the unknown. And that's where his faith ended up taking him, into the unknown. Uh, So it actually moved his actions. Um, So one thing that we understand is that faith is not just simply faith alone, but faith actually ends up moving our heart, and then it ends up moving our actions. Okay, so I believe, by the way, that I have uh, the most beautiful children in the world, right? I believe that. I truly believe that, and I have faith in that. My, my faith is that I have the most beautiful children in the world, right? Now, 
every single morning, every single morning, they wake me up, right? And they, they both of them come to my bed, and they both wake me up. They go, Daddy, Daddy, whatever. And, and my eyes, like, slowly open with all that goop in there. And uh, I see through the blurriness that uh, I have the most beautiful children in the world, right? And then that quickly turns into irritation. But it, there's that split-second moment where I look at them, and it's like, oh, yes, I truly have the most beautiful children in the world. Now, if you were to ask me, prove it. Like, prove that you have the most beautiful children in the world. Um, like, I don't know, take them to some beauty pageant and have them stand up and, like, prove it. Like, have them win the uh, my, my response to you would be that I don't care. Like, I don't need to prove it to you. I don't care, right? I don't care what you think about that, right? I, as long as I know that they're the most beautiful children in the world. So, so I have this faith that they're the most beautiful children in the world. It's something that's beautiful to me. It's something that's subjective to me. It's something that's personal to me. And it impacts my heart, but also impacts my actions, it also impacts the way that I interact with them day to day, right? So my daughter, um, she has this thing where, like, so first of all, I have to read her a book every night before she goes to sleep, right? So, and, and that's fine. And, and it all started out with this one book, which is the book about the, this caterpillar that goes through these fruit. And then, um, and then after a week, I got kind of bored of the book. So I said, hey, uh, Lucy, why don't we read another book? So I pick out another book. Right? And uh, now this is a book about um, the ABCs on Sesame Street, right? So we read that, and then she gets bored of that book. So I'm like, okay, uh, Lucy, like, why don't we actually get another book? And then we pick out another book about uh, Monday eating spaghetti, right? It's called Today's Monday. Uh, and then um, we read that. After another week, I get bored of that book. But here's what starts happening, right? Um, not only does she want to read the new book, but she wants to read the previous, two previous books. So I gotta start all over from the beginning, right? The, the problem with this is that it keeps compounding. It, it starts compounding, and my wife, by the way, she's just like, okay, bye, you know, go to sleep, whatever. <laughs> but I can't do that. Like, I don't have that kind of willpower, and it's too late. I've, I've gone to the point of no return, which is not good, right? So I've gone to the point where, like, she's expecting it, she's conditioned with it, and that's the way that she goes to sleep, right? Uh, so now I'm on, like, 10 books. Right? I'm on like 10 books and I'm like, and like, by like the fifth book, I'm like, Lucy, can, can we just like cut it off now? Like, can we just like stop, just, just stop, right? But she's like, no, 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 the caterpillar, caterpillar, caterpillar. So I'm like, okay, caterpillar. And there comes a point, I think, when I'm reading these books, and I, by the way, I know, I, I just want you guys to know, like, I know this is my fault. Like, I know this is, I, I did a bad thing, right? This is a bad habit. I'm not saying this is good, but there comes a point, like midway through when I'm reading the book where I'm like, like, what am I doing with my life, right? <laughs> like, what, what is, this is insanity, right? Like, what is, this goes on, this goes on forever, right? And I um, start, like, skipping pages and stuff like that. Anyway. <laughs> so, so as I'm thinking that, I'm like, what would actually compel, like, me to do that, right? Well, it's the fact that, like, I, I love my kids, right? And I think they're the most beautiful children in the world. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't do that. And see, that's how faith is supposed to in impact our, our actions, Right? It's like we, we take it to our heart. We see God for all of his beauty, and then we allow that to impact us in how we behave, how we act in our obedience to him. What else does it do? Well, Christian faith then brings new meaning and purpose to our lives, right? So it not only impacts our hearts and our actions, but then it also brings new meaning to our lives. Now, here's the question. Like, uh, as Christians, what is the purpose of our life? Right, because if, if the purpose of our life is just to find joy in our life, like, I'm pretty sure heaven would be a better place, right? Like, we could just kind of zoom our way up <laughs> to heaven, <laughs> or, and, and we wouldn't have to actually be here. Like, what would be the point of actually being here, right? So what is the actual purpose of us Christians being here? And here's the response in Matthew chapter 13, verse 31, 32. Jesus put another parable before them, and he said, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed, that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but it grows larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree. The birds of the air can come and make nests on its branches. What is this talking about? It's talking about the kingdom of heaven and the growth and the expansion of the kingdom of heaven, right? And, and by the way, when it talks about kingdom of heaven, there's always two references in the Bible to the kingdom of heaven. There's the actual kingdom of heaven where we go when we die, but there's also the kingdom of heaven here. So here's, here's, here's our purpose, and I'll share with you guys what our purpose is as Christians. Our purpose as Christians is to expand the kingdom of heaven here. Now, how do we do that? Well, 
there's two ways, right, or two categories in my mind, right? First of all, there's one which is evangelism, right, through, through spreading the word, through loving people. But the second thing is that we as Christians are called to expand the kingdom of heaven here using our acts of love, kindness, compassion, grace. Using everything good that God has poured into our lives to then be a light to this world. We are called to be a light to this world. You know, so I, we did this Extending Hope giving campaign, um, and I never thought what an impact that it could make. You know, and um, one of the things that, that our leadership team initially, when we were, what, that, that, that I proposed to our leadership team, because we've actually been talking a long, long time ago uh, about how we can bless this school, right? So we've actually been talking that we just never really had the, the, the method and the way of doing it, right? But when we actually figured that out and we were able to bless the school with our donation during our Extending Hope uh, giving campaign, um, I visited the school and I visited uh, Mary, who, who some of you have seen when she came up here, um, just to talk about some of the needs of the school. Um, and when I visited her, Mary, for those of you who don't know, is somebody who actually grew up in the church, right? But she had fallen away, right, from the church. And um, one of the things that she really expressed to me, you know, as, we, as I, we gave her the donation was that, like, she had never known a church to be like this. Like, she had never known her life for church to be a place of, like, such generosity. You know, and when I look at that, I'm like, that's a part of the kingdom of heaven, it's a part of the way, like, look, look, we're never going to get it to the way that it is when we'll see it in the kingdom of heaven, when we're actually, like, there. But it's our, it's, it's, it's our part as Christians to just give people a little glimpse of that, to bless people in a way so that they get a little bit of a glimpse of that, right? So that's also what it means for us to expand the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so in, in ancient Greece, there was a uh, philosopher named uh, Plato, and um, Plato had this, this, this famous concept that we call Plato's cave, right? Uh, in the concept of Plato's cave, basically what he said was that people were like prisoners, and basically they were chained uh, inside a cave, and there was a fire behind them. And basically, the, the creatures and people would walk behind these people, and they were born and raised their entire lives in these chains, and all they would really see are the shadows on the walls. So their reality and everything that they see is just simply the shadows on the walls. They don't know anything beyond the shadows on the walls. So the actual creatures and things that pass behind them, uh, they have no real, real perception of other than just simply the shadows, right? But then Plato goes on to say that, like, what if? Like, what if somebody was able to break free from that? So what, what if somebody was actually able to break free and turn around? Right, break free from the chains and turn around and, and see that the fire was actually the, the, what was projecting the shadows on the walls and actually see the creatures, actually see the people walking by for what they truly were. Right? And that's what Plato said. But then he goes on another step further. He goes, well, one of the things is that like, people might freak out because you, that reality might be so like, different than what you're used to that you may actually turn back around and go to the chains. Right? You may actually want to go back to the chains and just look at the shadows because you're like, well, that's more comfortable for me. That's more of my reality. So every, every, every year, we kind of reset, and we do this, these things called New Year's resolutions, and we come up with a New Year um, plan, and, and we say, there's a new year, there's a new beginning, right? Um, and one of the things that I want to share with you guys as Christians is like, every single day that we live our lives, um, we, could, we, we so easily fall into the trap of looking at the shadows. We so easily fall into the trap of perceiving uh, the, the things that the world projects as, as the meaning of our lives, right? We go, the, the world goes, well, all you got to do is reach as far as you can for success. All you got to do is build this family. All you got to do is gain as much uh, wealth as possible, gain as much power as possible. These are the things that will lead you to happiness. And so we stand there chained and looking at the shadows. And even when we have those moments where we turn around, we go right back to the shadows, right? And that, I think that's one good thing about church and uh, among other things, right, is that it, it's this reminder for us. It's this reminder for us to not look at the shadows, to not be tricked and betrayed by the shadows, but we keep on looking at that. And then Plato actually would go another step further. He says, well, what if somebody actually goes beyond the fire, beyond the creatures, and outside of the cave? Then what would happen? Well, Plato says that the person will come and then for the very first time, be in contact with the sun itself, 
and actually see the sun, actually see the source of light, right? For all of its beauty, for all of its power and majesty and glory, the person will be able to actually see it. And if the person would be in the presence of the sun long enough, well, then the pre- person could be able to see everything for what its true reality is, right? And then finally, Plato says this one last thing, which is that he says that undoubtedly, undoubtedly, without a doubt, that person would turn around and go back into that cave and tell the others. In the year 2020, what if we made our ways out of that cave and we gazed and we looked at God for all of his beauty, for all of his majesty, for all of his splendor, but as he sends Jesus Christ into our lives as a sacrifice for all of his love, for all of his compassion, for all of his grace that he pours into each and individual one of our lives. And what if this impacts us so much that we can actually take it to our heart and allow it to lead our actions, that we expand the kingdom of heaven by making this world a better place, at least with the little things that we have. Maybe God is calling us to be more patient. Maybe God is calling us to be more kind and compassionate. Maybe God is calling us to be more generous. Maybe God is calling us to be more hospitable. Maybe God is calling us to inconvenience ourselves once in a while to expand the kingdom of heaven, to give people that taste of what it's like, right? And so uh, as I invite the worship team to come up and we enter into 2020 with faith, will we be able to gaze upon the ultimate source of light with all of his splendor, with all of his glory, with all of his majesty, but all of his love as well? And will we be able to receive it and take it in and allow it to impact our lives? And so that's something that I want us to reflect on 